debate at the United Nations holds the spotlight of world attention as the nations once more try to find a road to peace. There is not much optimism that a permanent solution to the Middle Eastern crisis can be found. The Bible predicts that at some future point in history, the nations of the world will gather in the Middle East for at least two historic battles, the Battle of the Valley of Jehoshaphat and the Battle of Armageddon. Many biblical scholars think we are seeing the shuffling on the stage for the last great events of history. Certainly every Christian should be watching, expectant, working, sacrificing, praying, and prepared for these historic events that are unfolding daily before our eyes that could be the prelude to the coming again of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In spite of world pessimism concerning the possibilities of world peace, the Bible says that we are to seek peace and pursue it. God has said, I am for peace, but man is for war. God would like for man to enjoy the tranquility of world peace, but as long as man's nature is corrupted by sin, it is impossible. When Christ came to earth, he was called the Prince of Peace. But in announcing his coming, the angel said, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Notice that the glory to God in the highest preceded peace on earth. Until the nations of the world are willing to give Christ his rightful place, there will be no peace. In fact, Christ warned that there will be wars and rumors of wars until the day of his appearing. All of life testifies that there is a conflict of the ages that penetrates every generation regardless of color, race, or creed. Good and evil can never be equated. As long as the principle of sin exists in the world, the eternal conflict will continue to rage. This world with its contrasting and conflicting forces is a gigantic battlefield of flashing swords and mortal combat. Lawlessness is in conflict with the lawful. The world of intrigue and dishonesty is in conflict with truth and honesty. The world of intolerance is at odds with tolerance and human understanding. The world of lust and pleasure is in conflict with propriety and purity. The world of godlessness is at odds with the world of godliness and righteousness. Disorder is at war with decency and order. We must conclude that we live in a world of unending conflict. Little wonder then that Christ said, I am come not to send peace but a sword. He was saying in effect that the symbol of life is not an olive branch or a palm leaf but a sword. He did not gloss over the facts of life but face them realistically. He was saying to his disciples, this is war. Prepare yourselves for battle. True, his sword never dripped with blood. For when Peter wielded a sword of steel against Malchus, Jesus said, he that uses the sword shall perish with the sword. So the sword that Jesus places in the hands of his soldiers is not one that plunders, maims, and kills. It is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But even though it is a weapon of spiritual dimensions, it pierces, divides asunder, subdues its foes, and lays waste the powers of darkness. Thus the whole world is a battlefield. Even the Christian who has taken Christ the Prince of Peace in his heart finds little rest from spiritual conflict. The Bible specifically mentions three enemies of the Christian, the world, the flesh, and the devil. They are combined to form a powerful foe to defeat and frustrate God's plan and purpose in the lives of men. The world is Satan's ground force, making its attack on the horizontal level. The flesh is the subversive force, working from within to sap us of divine strength and effectiveness. The devil is the power and prince of the air and represents a diabolical air core which bombards the Christian continually in an all-out effort to defeat our Christian offensive. These satanic forces are graphically described in Ephesians in these words, wherein in times past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. First. The Bible teaches the world is at war with the spiritually minded Christian. Worldliness is a mood, a tempo, and an attitude of soul which peers out horizontally upon life. Its head is never lifted upward in recognition to God. Its gaze is manward, never Godward. It is that materialistic, sensual view of life which centers its attention on the gratification of the lower appetites and desires, completely blind to the things of the spirit. To this kind of world, God is not just denied, he is forgotten. The Christian is at odds and at war with this aspect of the world. 
It stoned the prophets, it burned the martyrs, it crucified Christ, and it still antagonizes people who dare to live apart from its philosophy and power. The Bible warns that we are to love not the world, neither the things that are of the world. The Bible again warns that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Thus the Christian finds himself in mortal daily conflict with the world round about him, and he is not to yield an inch. Secondly, the flesh is at war with the Christian. Spell the first four letters of the word flesh backwards and you have the word self. The word flesh is the biblical word for our old nature, the nature of sin. The apostle Peter, who knew a great deal about the struggle with the flesh, said, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. The flesh is the enemy within, the spiritual fifth columnist. Our old nature, even though it has been subdued to a degree by the Spirit of God which dwells in the Christian, cries for self-expression. Thus the Christian finds that his greatest conflict is oftentimes with himself. In spite of the fact that you have come to Christ, the Bible teaches that the old nature with all of its corruption is still there and that these evil temptations come from within. In other words, a traitor is living within. That wretched bent towards sin is ever present to drag you down. War has been declared. You now have two natures in conflict and each one is striving for the victory. The Bible teaches the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. It is the battle of the self-life and the Christ life. The old nature cannot please God. It cannot be converted or even patched up. However, the scripture does give great hope in this conflict. When Christ died, he took you with him to the cross and the old nature can be made inoperative and you can reckon yourselves dead indeed unto sin by faith and victory can be obtained. Paul said he had no confidence in the flesh. On another occasion he said, I make no provision for the flesh. On another occasion he said, I keep my body under. We are to so completely yield and surrender ourselves to God that we can by faith reckon the old nature dead indeed unto sin. The third enemy that the Christian has is Satan. He is out to defeat the Christian. He well knows that the child of God is a dangerous enemy to his cause. He made every effort to tempt and defeat Christ. Today, he concentrates on Christ's followers. He is the commander-in-chief of the powers of evil, and his main attack is launched against those who have taken sides with Christ. He harasses, he accuses, he tempts, he devours, he deceives, he lies, he murders, he tempts, he works through his allies, the world and the flesh, to work havoc in the church, to hinder the progress of righteousness, to discourage and distress the Christians, and to weaken the Christian offensive. The Bible says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. He is a powerful foe who is called the God of this world, the prince of this world, and the prince and the power of the air. While the scripture teaches that we are not to love the world and we are to make no provision for the flesh, the scripture teaches we are to stand up and resist the devil and he will flee from us. We are not to give place to the devil. We are not to kowtow and run from him. But before that, God says, submit yourselves to God. If you have fully submitted yourself completely to Christ, then you can resist the devil. And the Bible promises he will flee from you. The devil will tremble when you pray. He will be defeated when you quote or read a passage of scripture to him. These then are our three foes, the devil, the world, and the flesh. Our attitude toward them as Christians can be summed up in one word, renounce. There can be no bargaining, compromise, or hesitation. Absolute renunciation is the only possible course to a Christian seeking complete victory. In relation to the devil, we resist him only as we submit ourselves to God. In relation to the world, the Bible says, this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. In relation to the flesh, the Bible says, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Yes, there is glorious news to those of you that are fighting these battles and temptations. You're not asked to fight the battle alone. The Bible says in Romans 8, 13, that you by the spirit shall put to death the deeds of the body. 
Remember, Christ promised that he would never leave us nor forsake us. Jesus promised after he left the earth, he would send another, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, who is called a comforter, which actually means one that helps alongside that he may abide with us forever. It is this Holy Spirit living within us that produces the peace of God in our hearts in the midst of the struggles of life. This is a peace the world cannot know. It is only known to the child of God. This peace that God gives is based upon our faith in him. The Christian does not pretend to believe. He does not half believe. He does not believe today and doubt tomorrow. He believes. He believes that the hairs of our head are numbered and that not even a sparrow falls to the ground but that the Father knows. He believes that the universe is in keeping of infinite wisdom and infinite love. In ways he cannot fully understand, he believes that God directs the course of history and cares at the same time for each individual soul. Thus, during this critical period of world history, the Christian knows that nothing can happen in the universe but by the permission of God. No scientific research can damage the framework of God's plan. Man's freedom is real but limited. He cannot extinguish the stars, pluck the sun from the sky, prevent the return of spring, quench a mother's love, or defeat the divine purposes revealed forever at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, when the Christian looks at the conflicts and wars around him and within him, there is peace because he has faith in the Prince of Peace. He is able to say, whate'er events betide, thy will they all perform. Thus, as we stand in the midst of a crucial United Nations debate, the true Christian is the only person in the world that has complete optimism that the future is in God's hands and in the midst of the conflicts of life, he has peace. Do you know today this peace that comes from God? First, there must be peace with God. You can make your peace with God today by surrendering your life to Jesus Christ as Savior. He died on the cross to purchase your peace he shed his blood that you might have forgiveness of sin. But before you can have the peace of God and the peace from God, you must have peace with God. And you will only find peace with God at the foot of the cross. Therefore, I call upon you today to repent of your sins and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you can have the peace that God has promised to all of those that are members of the body of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ.